Well, the Bible reading this morning uh, is from Psalm 123. Uh, You'll find that on the screen. You'll find that in the service sheets you might have printed off. You can follow along in your own Bibles at home. Psalm 123, a song of ascents. I lift my eyes to you, the one enthroned in heaven, like a servant's eyes on his master's hand, like a servant girl's eyes on her mistress's hand. So our eyes are on the Lord our God until he shows us favour. Show us favour, Lord, show us favour, for we've had more than enough contempt. We've had more than enough scorn from the arrogant and contempt from the proud. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's a sermon outline there in your service sheets and there's an opportunity uh, for you to uh, ask questions in the comments box down the bottom of this web page. And Neil or I will endeavour to get back to you uh, as quickly as we can. Where is your God now? Have you ever heard that question? Has anyone ever asked you that question? Have you ever seen that question raised or stated or written? Very rarely it's a heartfelt plea for help, a desire for revelation and understanding. But more often than not, it's a statement of scorn or contempt, uh, pride and arrogance. It's a question that's brought out when people think the circumstances or events surrounding them prove the stupidity of God, the irrelevance of God, the complete absence of God. It's a question that can be poured out onto God's people in an effort of denigration and dismissal. It's not the only way God's people are scorned or treated as contemptible might be because they stand out from their stance on certain issues. might be because they're troublesome in their presence in a largely homogenous community. might be because the society they live in dismisses God and all that he stands for. Now, we rarely face where we are today the sustained social pressure of such contempt and pride and arrogance. There are moments, but often we experience it more personally, don't we? Uh, in relationships, in family, in community, in workplaces. There might be subtle digs, there might be a full frontal attack, or there might just be a cold shoulder and inconvenient scheduling. What's your tendency when that contempt is poured out? I have two tendencies, both of which I've indulged this week. Uh, On the one hand, I crawl into my own belly button and drown in a pool of self-pity. Woe is me. On the other hand, I lash out in what I think is righteous anger, but it's really just a defence mechanism that I take to cover my own fears and worries. It's not a unique situation for God's people, this contempt. I mean, if God's people are representing God as he is and as they should be, That's offensive to a world populated by seven billion gods, isn't it, who think they're better than God. So what should we do? Psalm 123 gives us this very clear piece of wisdom. Lift your eyes to the one enthroned in heaven for his sustaining favour. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your words. Thank you for these four verses. Father, open our eyes and hearts and minds and lives to have them sink deep into us so that our eyes gaze upwards rather than inwards or in anger. Amen. I'm at point two on the outline, the Psalter. We love the Psalms, at least personally, if not corporately. Uh, The Psalms sit like our hearts at the centre of the Bible. Uh, Its geographical place in the Bible matches its place for many of us in our own emotions. It's 150 prayers, which are poems or songs. It's been described as the hymn book of God's people, and rightly so. It's one of the two most quoted books in the Old Testament from the in the New Testament from the Old Testament, alongside Isaiah. It's full of some of Christianity's favourite phrases, like "As the deer pants for the water." I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? By the rivers of Babylon, and we could go on. But it's also a puzzling and even difficult book. Does it have a theme? Is there any discernible structure 
How do I, in narrow, brighter day, understand phrases like, you anoint my head with oil and the statements of seeming perfection in my soul by the psalmist? How do we pray, sing, or state these prayers today? Well, you could just make a bold transfer, just read them as they are and they remain God's word and go from there. But I actually want to begin this time in God's word by making a suggestion, a simple five-step process I'll get to Psalm 123 in a moment. A simple five-step process that might prove helpful. That's not exhaustive. It's not even that sophisticated. But it's a method that I've started to use to understand the guts of these prayers within the flow of God's commitment to dealing with sin in the world and the way I can say them today as someone who lives after Jesus Christ. We need to understand the times, the genre, the, what, how these were composed and compiled. The genre, the type of literature of the Psalms is very important to grasp. They're prayers which are poetic in form. In that sense, they use imagery and emotion. They tug at the heartstrings with simile and metaphor, all the poetic tools to convey the revelation of God. It's not a letter. It's not a manual for a John Deere tractor. It's not history, prophecy, a vision. This is poetry. These prayers were composed at certain points in the history of God's people. We're given indications that Psalm 90 was written by Moses. Psalm 137 was written as God's people in exile in Babylon. In between, there are numerous references to the temple, to King David, King Solomon, to the gathering of God's people in Jerusalem. At points, we're given little subheadings to the particular psalms. Did you see the one there at the start in italics uh, in Psalm 123? Uh, These are part of the psalm. They should be read as part of the psalm. They give us some of the details of their composure. But outside this, these prayers seem often to float in some historical vacuum. Their pleas and praises could be relevant at many points in the history of God's people. It seems then that these prayers were compiled at a certain point. Now, there's some debate about this. It seems most likely that the final form, with even some of the subheadings being inserted, took place sometime during the time of the Second Temple when God's people came back from exile in Babylon. At this point, it seems that the current structure of five books with a, some sense of organisation in the sections like The Songs of Ascent, Psalm 120 to 134, seems that this structure was finalised at this point. It's almost universally recognised that Psalms 1 and 2 are the introduction to the whole salt of the book of Psalms. They lay out the key themes, the ideas of the book as a whole. They're kind of like the interpretational keys. Psalm 1 makes clear that there are two ways that life can be lived, by being rooted in God's word, or not. The first option is the option of wisdom. It leads to life as it should be. The second option is the option of the wicked and the foolish and leads to a life with the substance of chaff. This book then is part of the word of God that leads to life as it should be. Set your roots in it. Psalm 2 makes clear that despite our aspirations, God has set his king above all of the earth. As a coronation psalm that was read at the coronation of Israel's kings, there was an obvious connection with the family of David. The wise person, the person who has their roots set down deep into God's word, the wise person takes refuge in this king. The foolish person seeks to rebel against this king and faces complete destruction and annihilation. This book then is about the life of refuge in the one enthroned in heaven by God. I could be so bold as to suggest that you need these two psalms to understand and apply any of the psalms. At this point, it's worth considering the possible context for the moment when a psalm was composed and the moment when it first might have been used. In some instances, there are explicit clues. Psalm 137 makes clear that the psalmist is sitting in Babylon by the rivers in mournful exile. 
Other psalms give hints of authorship, a Davidic or sung by the people, the, the, the people connected with Asaph in the temple. Some give a hint of history. Psalm 3 suggests that the context was David fleeing from his son Absalom. In each of these moments, when you know something like that, it's worth spending some time matching the tone of the psalm with the account of the event that occurs elsewhere in the Bible. At times there are no explicit clues and you can use some of your imagination within the boundaries of the biblical framework to imagine how and when it might have been composed. Take Psalm 23, for example. That Psalm 23 could have been written as David enjoyed his life as a shepherd, sitting under a tree by a brook in a paddock full of green grass, looking out over his flock. It could have been written by David when he was on the run from Saul with a bunch of mercenaries and bandits with no home, but knowing that God would shepherd him. Or even as I like to think, and I think most likely, it could have been written on his deathbed as he's looking back on his life and about to face his greatest enemy, which is death. And other times we're given very clear clues about the psalm and when it should be used. For example, the Songs of Ascent, Psalms 120 to 134, were to be used as God's mob moved to Jerusalem for their gatherings as the people of God, coming in as individuals, like the little creeks feeding into a massive tributary as they all gathered together on that hill in the temple as one people, God's mob. Well, that helps us understand these prayers within the life of Israel as God's people. But we live after Jesus a long time away, a long time away in geography, in culture, in what surrounds us, what we're immersed in. And the key for us lies in Jesus' words in Luke 24, 44, after he's been raised from the dead, as he spends time with his closest followers preparing them for when he leaves, ascending into heaven. Luke 24, 44 says, Jesus told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. As we've seen time and time again in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is the end point of God's commitment to dealing with the sin of the world. He's everything that God's people are meant to be in one man. He's the living embodiment of the Old Testament. And that means that the prayers of God's people in the Psalter find their resonance, their fulfillment in him. If you briefly consider it, he is Psalm 1, the man who is both God's word and who is rooted perfectly in God's word. Who could forget the way he responds, responds to the devil in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, relying on the book of Deuteronomy? If you briefly consider it, he's Psalm 2, God's king, the son of David, the one enthroned in heaven, the son of God, dearly loved by his father. Remember those words that God spoke from the heavens at his baptism in Matthew three seventeen, The imagery of Revelation 5 as the lamb of God comes into the throne room of all the universe. For us to understand and pray these prayers, we must see them, understand them as lived and fulfilled by Jesus first. Now, as people now brought into God's people by being connected to Jesus through faith, remember the Sermon on the Mount from last year? These then can be prayed and sung by us because Jesus lived them and so brought us into God's people. They are to be our hymn book. Now, I know that I spent well over half my sermon taking you through that process. But if you get nothing else out of this time in God's word, take at least this. This is how I think we can faithfully handle, appropriate and plumb the depths of the Psalter for us as God's people today, a simple five-step process. Well, the psalmist, whoever they are, has faced a hostile world. I'm at point three on the outline. In fact, God's people have faced a hostile world. A look there in Psalm 123 from the end of verse 3. For we've had more than enough contempt. We've had more than enough scorn from the arrogant and contempt from the proud. Remember, this is a song of a sense. 
as they wander along these roads and up that hill to Jerusalem to the temple, that symbol of God's presence with his people. God's people know the world as a place where this question is constantly thrown at them. Where is your God now? It's the question not of searching pain but of contempt and scorn from those who think they can be God instead of God. It's a question that God's people have been asked any number of times in their existence as they wandered in the desert for 40 years, as they lived in the chaos and invasions of the time of the book of Judges, as the righteous lived in desperation in the times of Amos and Habakkuk, as they lived in exile and were subjected to international ridicule, as they returned home and the local governors laughed at their feeble attempts to rebuild the temple. In all of those instances, God's people were scorned and oppressed and treated with contempt. In all of those instances, the presence of God was questioned and his power and nature and character. In all of those instances, there are circumstances for the composition of this prayer. So what does the psalmist do? Do they descend into self-pity? Do they lash out in self-reinforcing violence? Do they seek to take matters into their own hands? Well, the psalmist states clearly that what is to be done when God's people experience such contempt is a change of gaze. Look there in verse 1. I lift my eyes to you, the one enthroned in heaven, like a servant's eyes on his master's hand, like a servant's girl's on her mistress's hand. So our eyes are on the Lord, our God, until he shows us favour. The eyes of the psalmist do not move inward. The eyes of the psalmist do not go red with anger. The eyes of the psalmist are lifted upwards to the God enthroned King of the universe, seated above all things and all humans. That's an important moment. Because this psalmist is showing that he or she is rooted in God's word, just like Psalm 1 says. The psalmist is rooted in God's word because they seem to be quoting from Psalm 2 to describe their only hope, that the king enthroned by God on his holy mountain, God's son, who inherits the whole universe. In fact, what follows... We see the psalmist, the people of God, displaying the truth of taking refuge in the one enthroned by God. That's the only way to avoid the destruction that the wicked and arrogant face and bring. And the image that is used to emphasise this dependence is one that would have been very clear and close and personal to the original readers, the dependence of a servant or a master. That's not an image of subservience or grovelling but of gracious responsibility and dependence. It's dependence by the servant, by God's people, because they know that their whole existence depends upon depending upon God's king. It's the gracious responsibility by that king, that master, the God-enthroned ruler, who is committed to provide everything his dependents need. That powerful image in verses 1 and 2 is tied together with that commonality of the eyes lifted upwards, the gaze directed. And so we then come to the prayer, the the request being uttered at point 5. Look there in verse 3. Look there in verse 3. Show us favour, Lord. Show us favour, for we've had more than enough contempt. The people of God... Their eyes fixed on God's king, their vision fixed on the symbol of God's presence with them, the temple as they walk up to it, simply ask for God's mercy, God's loving favour. It's the same favour as the priest declared to God's king, God's people consistently when they met in Numbers chapter 6 verse 5. It's the same favour of the God who had chosen these people to represent him in a world that dismissed him. It's the same favour that God's people need to represent him in the face of that contempt and scorn. It's the favour that can only come from the author of life, the master of justice and judgment, the sole giver of mercy to those who'd rather rebel. You notice there's no content for that favour? 
No statement about how that favour should look or when it should be delivered or where it should play out. It's just a statement of, God, can you show us favour? The favour that only you can give. And that's enough for God's people as they turn to leave and return to a continually scornful world. Well, we've already seen Jesus face that same scorn and contempt, haven't we? I'm at point six on the outline. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, as the religious leaders moved to destroy him, that's the fact right throughout his life. His family at one point think him mad. His own leaders plan to wipe him from the face of the earth. His own people chant for his death and one of his closest friends betrays him. In that sense, he is God's people. Facing the contempt and the scorn of the proud and the arrogant. But it becomes even more pointed in his last moments on earth, doesn't it? From that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane through to his answers at his own trial, right up until his final breath on the cross when he gives his spirit up to his Father. At every point, he turns his eyes upwards to his Father enthroned in heaven. At every point, as he faces the scorn and contempt of the people around him, the proud and the arrogant, where is your God now? He requests the merciful favour of God and he knows that that favour will be enough. And it is, isn't it? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. God exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet (coughs) and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. God's favour was enough to sustain Jesus It raised him from the dead through the exercise of the power of God. It placed him as the one enthroned in heaven above all rulers and authorities. It put him there as the one who beats death and has unrivaled power and he does it all for the church, which is his body. He does it all for those who take refuge in him. Remember Psalm 2? You've heard that question. Where is your God now? I'm at point seven. Asked not in desperate need, but thrown out in scorn and contempt through action and attitude. We've heard it as God's people. We've heard it as God's person. And as we live as both an individual and in community, Jesus being Psalm 123 allows us to pray. This is the gentle and kind rebuke a bloke like me needs, perhaps even you. It's the gentle push away from sinking into self-pity or lashing out in self-righteous anger. It's the gentle push for me to raise my eyes from my belly button to the one enthroned in heaven above life and death for me so that favour from God can come to me. This is a reminder to turn first to prayer when faced by contempt, when faced by scorn to place my request before the one enthroned in heaven. Now, in pragmatic terms, it's well nigh impossible to put a request for favour before the one enthroned in heaven and persist in self-pity or anger. In a very real sense, it's what we must do consistently. Faced by a world that thinks it can be God instead of God, we must ask God for his favour, whatever form that favour takes. Remember again what we learn in Matthew 6, 33, Matthew 11, verse 28. This is the reminder to be so rooted in the word of God, the revelation of God himself, that when scorn and contempt are thrown our way, we are so rooted that it is almost automatic that our eyes lift upward to the one enthroned in heaven, to Jesus himself. In this sense, I want to lay a challenge before you. As individuals, 
as members of a community of God's people. I want to encourage you to read one psalm a day. As you read, perhaps work quickly through those five steps that we outlined earlier and then pray in line with one way that Jesus fulfills that particular psalm. As we do this daily and as people throw that scornful question at us, this rooting in the word of God will lift our eyes to the one enthroned in heaven time and time again. Let me pray. Dear Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the image of that psalmist so rooted in your word that when he was faced with the scorn and contempt as part of God's community, the scorn and contempt that came from the world, his eyes were immediately lifted to the one enthroned in heaven. Father, please work those roots in us deep down into your word so that we not only know the one enthroned in heaven, we not only know you as our Father, but we so know you that when scorn and contempt is thrown our way, our gaze rises to your Son. Father, as this change takes place in us, we pray that you'll help us to introduce others in this world to the one who can show them the favour we need for the life that you created. Amen.